Sound Words, Christian Magazine, Volumes 41 to 50. Republished by Irving Risch, host of Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded podcast. Exodus, the Book of Redemption and Relationship. A. Shepherd. We will go through the entire book in 24 parts. Part 5 of 24. Signs of the Deliverer. Exodus chapter 4. We are now brought to the threshold of those great and solemn events in which we view the irresistible power of God actively expressed in his sovereign ways in goodness toward his oppressed people, and in his sovereign ways in judgment toward their oppressors. As Paul could say in Romans chapter 9 verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very thing I have raised thee up from amongst men, that I might thus show in thee my power, and so that my name should be declared in all the earth. So then, to whom he wills he shows mercy, and whom he wills he hardens. But before these events claim our careful consideration, our attention is called to the tender and compassionate dealings of God with his wavering servant in preparing him for the accomplishment of the task with which he had entrusted him. To witness those elements of unbelief, a resolution, and indecision on the part of Moses, persisting even in the presence of these unmistakable evidences of divine power, is very humbling in the extreme. May we see in all this that the Spirit intends no disparagement of Moses, of whom God himself has marked out as conspicuously enjoying his favor, but rather as a salutary admonition to us. Lest we also should be guilty of similar conduct with less excuse, for God has set forth the wavering of a servant so faithful for the express purpose of guarding us from the like or other failures. God had already declared to Moses that they would hearken to his voice, Exodus chapter 3 verse 18, but Moses in this first verse of Exodus chapter 4 uses similar words in positive contradiction of the divine assurance. But God does not reject his failing servant, this spirit of unbelief is met by the spirit of grace and the display of divine power, and the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said a rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. This is the first of these signs of a miraculous nature in which is revealed the fullness of grace in which God condescended. To dispel the unworthy and unbelieving fears of one who in all these objects demonstrates conclusively that self is the beam in his eye completely obstructing the vision of faith. How forcibly this is seen in Exodus chapter 3 verse 11 where Moses says, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, but had not God, the I am that I am, said. And now come and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. It is ever right to have low thoughts of self but to virtually call in question the ability of God to carry into effect what he has purposed is far removed from that faith that comes to God believing that he is and is a rewarder of them that seek him out, for without faith it is impossible to please God. How beautifully and instructively this is seen in the beloved apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 9 to 10, but we ourselves had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not have our trust in ourselves but in the God who raises the dead, who has delivered us from so great a death and does deliver, in whom we confide that he will also yet deliver. And again in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5. Not that we are competent of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our competency is of God. But how graciously God comes down to Moses in meeting all the fears and falterings of his chosen servant. In the display of his grace and power, and moreover, investing him with that power by which he in turn would convince the children of Israel that he was their accredited deliverer approved and sent of God for their liberation from the house of bondmen. May we have ears open to hear as the instructed ones, the voice that speaks to us in all these things, and profit from its timely admonition. It is a thought of the greatest signification that the faith of the children of Israel in Moses as one sent of God for the deliverance was the vital point upon which everything depended. Not yet the deliverance, but the deliverer to whom was committed the power to ensure the deliverance, and in the consideration of this wondrous theme Moses, favoured servant as he undoubtedly was, pales into insignificance as the vision of faith is filled with the undimmed and perennial glory of one, superlatively greater than Moses, one who must in all things have the first place. How the contemplation of the person of the Saviour himself, gives a fullness to our thoughts and brings us into a greater measure of correspondence with the thoughts of God the Father as expressed with such an eloquence of feeling in those words. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul has found its delight, Matthew chapter 12 verse 18. 
All through John's Gospel we find the possession of eternal life is connected with faith in the person of the Saviour. He that believes on the Son has life eternal, and he that is not subject to the Son shall not see life, John chapter 3 verse 36. The word, subject, in the verse just quoted, involves, obedience of submission to his person. Then again in John chapter 20 verse 31, but these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing ye might have life in his name. This is the due order, the Saviour first then from and in him the salvation. Noah and those with him realized that the ark alone could shelter them from the judgment of God and ensure their emergence onto the renewed earth. No doubt our place, in Christ, has been secured in all the value of that redemptive work in virtue of which he has taken his place at the right hand of God. The blessed and eternal proof of the perfection of that work and of God's unqualified acceptance of it, but let us not forget that the altar sanctifies the gift. How forcibly this is brought before us in the beautiful language of the types. In Exodus chapter 27 of this same book the Spirit of God furnishes Moses with minute and precise instructions regarding the dimensions of the brazen altar and the materials from which it was to be constructed. And this altar has been referred to as a symbol of display in contradistinction to the lava and the altar of incense, which are symbols of approach. The words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 verse 19. For which is greater the gift or the altar which sanctifies the gift, is no doubt an allusion to this altar and justifies us in concluding that there is a peculiar distinction attaching to it. It is a vessel of display and sets forth in type the manifestation of God in Christ displayed in the fullness of grace as providing the divinely appointed meeting place between him and the sinner. It is specifically the altar of burnt offering, and speaks of Christ in his perfect suitability and adequacy to sustain the judgment of God, and to glorify him in the very place where sin had been. So that instead of pronouncing a curse he can show forth his righteousness at the present time. So that he should be just and justify him that is of the faith of Jesus. As we contemplate the incomparable greatness and glory of our great deliverer, having the first place in all things. How we long for the moment when, freed from every restricting influence, our hearts and lips and every faculty we possess shall be fully developed to join in the glad refrain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, and glory, and blessing. We have considered briefly, and no doubt imperfectly, how faith in the Deliverer is to proceed and produce faith in the Deliverance. Now in these signs committed to Moses with the necessary authority and power to display them before the people, in order to dispel their unbelief on the one hand, and on the other to mark with divine approval the person of the Deliverer, we can see that these are not unrelated to the condition of abject misery in which the people are found at this time. Indeed as we consider them thoughtfully we can discern a striking relevancy between them and the circumstances to which they are addressed. It could not he otherwise since these divinely given signs were indicative of God's intervention in power for the liberation of his people from the state of bitter servitude under which they groaned. The bondage in which we were held necessitated the exercise of power in grace for our deliverance, and another question of the gravest and most solemn import had to be met. The question of our moral state as having to do with God who is of holier eyes than to behold iniquity. These two things are suggested by the rod and the hand in the bosom. The rod in Moses' hand is a shepherd's rod, and exercised in divine power, as we shall see as we go through the book of Exodus. All power belongs unto God, and this shepherd's rod shows us how he uses it. Power with him always waits upon love. As another has expressed it so beautifully, the hand that wields the scepter of the universe is guided by the heart of him who has revealed himself not as power, nor even as righteousness. But as love, the rod in Moses' hand then, is the type of divine power, exercised in the fullness of his grace in the liberation of his people from a power too strong for them. Moses is told to cast it on the ground, and out of his hand the rod changes its character, it becomes a serpent. As we look around us today with thoughts of power being in the hands of him who, sitteth sovereign on the throne and ruleth all things well. Must we not own to a measure of bewilderment as we see the sure and certain marks and evidences of the mystery of God, not yet completed? The time in which God appears to be taking no account of what is taking place in the kingdoms of the world, the time of his silence. And in this connection another has said, the silence of God is the greatest mystery of our existence. Scripture itself puts the perplexing question. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee which frameth mischief by law?
surely the rod is to all appearance out of the shepherd's hand, and the prince of this world is not Christ but Satan. The claim he makes to worldwide dominion when he displays before the self-humbled Son of Man, all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, with the boast, all that is given unto me. And to whomsoever I will I give it, seems no empty boast. The rod seems not in his hand to whom it rightly belongs, but upon the ground, and satanic. But observe the beautiful accuracy of the type and the comfort which the Spirit has prepared for us in it. At the command of God the rod was cast out of Moses' hand, it did not slip out. God has not lost control of the world, after all, of his own will. And for his own wise purposes he has subjected man to the sway of him whom man has chosen to be his God and Prince. Then, when all has been fulfilled according to the mind of God, the great voices in the heaven will be heard saying, The kingdom of the world of our Lord and of his Christ is come. And he shall reign to the ages of ages. Then with joyful hearts and lips, we, the saints in heaven, will swell the glad refrain and say, We give thee thanks, Lord God Almighty, he who is, and who was, that thou hast taken thy great power and hast reigned, Revelation chapter 11 verse 17. Our principal concern, as enlightened by the Spirit, is the moral application of these deeply instructive and interesting types as illustrative of God's sovereign ways in grace towards us. In the glorious work of redemption whereby we have been delivered from the whole sphere and power of the adversary. And brought into such a wealth of relationship with himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has taken us into favor. Put us into a position of grace and favor, in the beloved. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of offenses, according to the riches of his grace. What are we to learn then from the rod of power in Moses' hand cast on the ground becoming a serpent, and on his seizing it becoming a rod again? At the beginning man was set up in authority, the rod of power being placed in his hands, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the whole earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. But in Genesis chapter 3 do we not see the rod of power cast from his hand and the power becoming satanic, assuming the character of evil. But in Moses taking the serpent by the tail we see Christ taking up all the consequences of man's sin, and Satan's power, wielded by him as the might of death. This blessed man of a new order, a heavenly order, one who is from above, and above all, has been made sin, and has gone into the very stronghold of the adversary's power. The domain of darkness and of death, annulling the usurper's power and delivering his captives from a power out of which they were unable to extricate themselves. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, and shall he that is rightfully captive be delivered? For thus saith the Lord, even the captive of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Isaiah chapter 49 verses 24 to 25. Power, exercised in grace has now been regained by man in the person of Jesus, and is being displayed for man's deliverance from every expression of the enemy's power. He Satan's power laid low, made sin, sin's reign o'er through, bowed to the grave, destroyed it so, and death by dying slew. Christ is alive forevermore, the beginning of the creation of God and has the keys of death and Hades. He is at the right hand of power, the true Benjamin, son of the right hand, exalted by God's right hand to be a leader and saviour, Acts 5. Power is in the hands of the man Christ Jesus for man's deliverance, it is available for all, none need remain in bondage to one who is a greater rebel than man himself. The God who committed himself in promise and covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has secured all power in the hand of Christ for the fulfilment of every promise and the complete deliverance of man from the power of the oppressor. Moses fleeing from the serpent would indicate man's inability to face the power of evil. The Lord Jesus alone could do this. It is remarkable to see in Mark's Gospel God's perfect servant presented as the one able to meet and overcome every element of Satan's power. And able also to invest his disciples with this power so that they can take up serpents. And so we, as indwelt by the Spirit, are invested with all the power of Christ risen at God's right hand. So that we can meet and overcome all the power of the enemy in a power not our own. But there is another question to be considered. Moses was instructed of God, put now thy hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and took it out, and behold his hand was leprous, as snow. And he said, put thy hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and took it out of his bosom, and behold it was turned again as his flesh. 
leprosy in the scriptures is a type of sin in its loathsomeness, its virulence and its power to spread. In its incipient stages its existence may not be proved by any external evidence. But the spot on the skin while not truly representing the extent of the disease might yet indicate that which lay much deeper reaching to the blood, the very life stream, no localized infection. But corrupting the whole man. Its invariable tendency unless checked by the intervention of God is to spread continually, blanching the hair and exposing the raw flesh and finally reducing the wretched victim to the state described so vividly by Isaiah. From the crown of the head to the sole of the foot, no soundness in him, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. In its capacity to spread, passing from one to another. It infected first those most in contact with the leper, his nearest and dearest, the inmates of his home and heart. God's treatment of it was to prescribe the complete isolation of him who was the victim of this loathsome disease. Shut out from his home, from the society of his fellowmen, he had to cover his upper lip and proclaim himself to be a source of pollution in the despairing whale, unclean. Unclean. All these descriptive details relating to one afflicted with leprosy can be seen in Leviticus chapter 13. And all the surrounding circumstances described in typical language stresses very forcibly the thought that sin is thus with God neither fortuitous nor limited in its incidence, but a growing, virulent, contagious, evil. Deeper than its superficial appearance would suggest, not to be measured by any outward appearance, and absolutely fatal in result apart from God's sovereign intervention in mercy. Let no man delude himself with the fallacious theory that sin is the effect of his circumstances, and that he is the victim of his environment. The tree is known by its fruit. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Depend upon it, if the hand be leprous, the heart is no better. But worse as being the very seat, the source of the disease, and cleansing must begin, not with the hand but with the heart. How powerfully does the type speak of how effectively God has dealt with sin, both in its source and its expression. Moses' hand thrust into his bosom became leprous, thrust into his bosom again it is restored. Defilement and cleansing both begin at the source, the heart. Leprosy in the heart is sin hidden, in the hand is sin exposed. God has used the water and blood which flowed from the side of the Lord Jesus, as the efficacious means of cleansing us from the guilt and defilement of sin. These then are the signs of the deliverer. The third sign is a prediction of judgment for obstinate unbelief, but there is no suggestion that the third sign was performed as necessary to overcome their unbelief. And it shall come to pass if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Water represents that which refreshes, the means of life and refreshment as coming from God but poured out on the ground becomes the symbol of judgment and of the consequences of judgment executed. Must not the stream of life and blessing from God ministered to needy man in an accepted time and a day of salvation become wrath and judgment if his goodness leads not to repentance? Every blessing is so much judgment if a Saviour's voice be disregarded. Despite these signs, however, in which was evidenced the invincible power of God, and which witnessed to the sovereign control of God over every circumstance through the instrumentality of his servant and in favor of his people. Moses still shows the hesitancy of unbelief. Self still obtrudes between this mighty God who had espoused the cause of his oppressed people and the magnitude of the task with which he was being entrusted and invested with that authoritative power which would ensure the successful accomplishment of all that God had committed to him. I am not eloquent neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses was truly presuming upon the long-suffering and forbearance which God had shown to him while he was manifesting in a very pronounced degree his facility for objecting. But now the anger of the Lord is kindled against his servant and he says, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also behold he goeth out to meet thee. And so the wavering of Moses is overcome, but he has lost much. Aaron was now to share with him what God had intended for him alone. Moreover Aaron as the mouthpiece of his brother would have the prominent place before men, yet in spite of Moses' persistent obstinacy and slowness of heart to respond to these divine promptings. God does not act in any arbitrary or capricious manner towards his servant, God is not a man that he should repent. 
he will not be thwarted in the least degree in the carrying out of his purposes, and so in tender grace he still reserves to his servant Moses the chief place before him. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put the words into his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and his mouth, and I will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall speak for thee unto the people, and it shall be that he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be unto him instead of God. It is as Moses' prophet, that Aaron is here announced, his associate and complement in the great work which God had committed to them. In all this we have a twofold type of the Lord Jesus as king and priest, redemption by power and by blood, without the latter there could not be the former. Priesthood sets forth the deliverer, and sacrifice procures the salvation. This in its true import Israel has not yet learned, their Moses is delayed by his need of Aaron, in a coming day when they look upon him, they shall not only see one whom they have pierced, but know why he had to stoop to that unexampled humiliation, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. And now Moses returns to Jethro, to find him willing to accede to his desire to see if his brethren in Egypt are yet alive. Then we have another wonderful expression of grace on the part of God in the opportune assurance that all the men are dead that sought his life. Thus we see the removal of every difficulty as he advances now with firm tread to the momentous climax that lay before him wherein the wrath of man would praise God, and what would not would be restrained. Once more he is warned of Pharaoh's stubbornness of heart, which, in the sovereign ways of God, would but subserve his purposes by providing him with the occasion of manifesting himself in all the glory and majesty of that name in which he had declared himself to be for his people. I am that I am. God then speaks of Israel as his son, his firstborn. They owe their place among the nations to his adoption of them, in accordance with his faithfulness to the covenant he had made with their fathers. They had not worked for this, it was according to God's sovereign choice, but as it was said to their father, Jacob, so is it with them, the children being not yet born. Neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, Romans chapter 9 verse 11. Yet this grace to Israel in no wise implies the rejection of other nations, but rather the reverse, as the promise to Abraham long before declared. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It is indeed blessed to know that Israel's God is ours. In connection with the covenant with Abraham the scene in the inn is pregnant with divine instruction. Circumcision was the sign of this very covenant, Genesis chapter 17. It was the expression of that renunciation of all confidence in the flesh in order to the display of God in almighty power. To borrow the words of another, God was going to put honor on Moses but there was dishonor to him in the house of Moses already. How came it that there lacked that which typifies the mortifying of the flesh in those who were nearest Moses? How came it that God's glory was forgotten in that which ought to have been prominent in the Father's heart? It endangered Moses. Moses was the responsible person, and God held to his order. But Moses received grace to bow before his chastening hand. Nevertheless his neglect in this matter was so serious in the sight of God, he sought to slay him. In our practical ways in service and testimony in order to be a vessel to honor sanctified and serviceable to the master, prepared for every good work, there must be the practical cutting off of the flesh. Guilty weakness in any form or degree is connected with the flesh, but in circumcision there is the setting aside of all that savors of fallen nature, giving place to the power of the Spirit. But ye are not in flesh but in spirit, if indeed God's Spirit dwell in you. But if by the Spirit ye put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Romans chapter 8 verses 9, 13, 14.